tonight. Another showdown could be looming in the fishery as an independent panel sets the price of snow crab. Right now, the factors are not in line for me to go fishing. I am not going fishing until we get this strain there. There is uncertainty among harvesters as the price setting panel sides with processors. It, it stands six to eight to ten feet high in places. It's a huge amount of gravel and stone and trees. Flooding in Corner Brook led to a landslide that washed away part of a road and pushed several vehicles into the river. The Newfoundland Growlers hockey team is folding, ending ECAHL hockey in this province. This is CBC Here and Now. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. We begin tonight with the fishery. Crab harvesters could be heading for another showdown, this time over snow crab prices. Some harvesters are saying they won't go fishing for crab under the new price set by an independent panel. Now, the panel sided with seafood producers late yesterday, a move fishermen say will cost them $35 million this season. Peter Cowan explains. The crab season is supposed to start in just a few days. Some crews are getting their gear ready for the most lucrative fishery of the year. But in a move that echoes the lead up to protests last year, the price setting panel has sided with processors, meaning fishermen will get $2.60 a pound. Right now the factors are not in line for me to go fishing. I am not going fishing until we get this straightened out. John Effort has become an influential voice in the fishery since protests last month delayed the provincial budget and led to a new agreement finalized just yesterday to open up the fishery to outside buyers and a review of the processing sector. Last year, fishermen tied up for weeks, upset over the low price of $2.20 a pound. The new system of setting a formula rather than a price was supposed to avoid a similar showdown, but fishermen and processors couldn't agree on a formula, leaving the independent panel to side with processors. Effort says the $2.80 a pound the union was proposing was a better deal. Right now, America is saying that we can't have more. Uh, that's, that's what we have to live by, and, uh, and the market is looking to be trending upwards. There's some hope that allowing outside buyers will mean a better price. Effort says he's heard from fishermen who've been offered three twenty-five a pound for their crab, picked up in this province, and shipped elsewhere for processing. It's unclear if the union will lead a tie-up again this year. Earlier this year, an arbitrator ruled that it broke the collective agreement last year and could be on the hook for processors' losses. Effort is being careful with his wording. Look, it's your business. You do what you think you should do. And again, I've got my decision made. I am not fishing until this is straightened away. The head of the seafood processors wasn't available for an interview today. The province and processors had warned that more disruptions in the fishery could hurt the province's reputation as a reliable supplier of crab. Peter Cowan, CBC. Well, a landslide in Corner Brook has washed away part of a road and pushed several vehicles into the Humber River. The landslide happened on Riverside Drive early this morning, just after midnight. A truck carrying two people was swept into the Humber River while another car was struck by falling rocks and dirt. The west coast of Newfoundland was hammered by heavy rainfall and melting snow over the long weekend. The road is now closed until further notice from Route 440 to Humber Road. The city is now examining the area and beginning the cleanup. On Riverside Drive itself is probably about 100, 150 feet wide, uh, which is, you know, it's, it's fairly huge on that, that portion of highway. It, it stands six to eight to 10 feet high in places. It's a huge amount of gravel and stone and trees uh, right across the road there. And no doubt that came down with great force to be able to push a vehicle <laughs> right off and submerge it in the Humber River. So, Well, some bad news for hockey fans in this province. The Newfoundland Growlers hockey team is folding. Railers will have to have a... As that one's shot right at the goal line, they score. Ninth of the night for Newfoundland with 4.4 to go in regulation. Well, that was the final goal in the short history of the Newfoundland Growlers. In a news release, the ECHL said its Board of Governors voted to terminate the Growlers for, quote, failure to fulfill its obligations under the ECHL bylaws. 
Earlier today, the ECHL officials met to talk about the future of the two Canadian teams in the league. Both are owned by St. John's-based Deacon Sports and Entertainment. Multiple news outlets have reported the Trois-Rivières Lions owed more than a million dollars in unpaid rent at the local arena. Radio Canada has now learned the Lions will have a reprieve until the end of the playoffs. In a separate news release, Deacon Sports say they have been trying to salvage both teams but couldn't finalize the sale of the Growlers. The Growlers will fold with its players on the ECHL contracts becoming free agents. Well, union leaders and politicians in Newfoundland and Labrador are applauding the Auditor General's decision to audit health contracts with the provincial government. It's something both the official opposition and the NDP have been seeking for months. There have also been repeated requests for an audit by the Registered Nurses Union. Those calls have focused largely on contracts the province signed with travel nurse agencies. Last year, the CBC reported the province paid more than $100 million for agency nurses and this year, the Globe and Mail raised more concerns about those contracts. Where there's smoke, there's obviously, a, you know, fire in this situation. So we obviously, in our caucus, said, you know, we have to ask the Auditor General to look at this. You know, we need an adult in the room to go in and say what's going on here. Our call was brought. We Not only did we ask for um, the, the travel nurses, we asked, you know, all uh, private entities providing a service to the health authority. Well, police in Labrador have arrested and charged a man in Northwest River with trafficking cocaine. It comes after criticism from the Innu Nation and former MP Peter Panashue that the RCMP aren't doing enough to stop drug dealers in the region. Panashue was arrested for smashing vehicle windows out of frustration with an alleged drug dealer in the community. Two days later, the Innu Nation backed Panashue, saying cocaine addiction has created a desperate situation in Shehajit and Natchwashish. It said the RCMP in Labrador aren't doing enough to deal with the illicit drug trade. Then, the next night, the RCMP arrested a man in Northwest River and seized cocaine, cash, and guns. Sheila Cooper lives in Northwest River. She wonders whether the arrest would have happened without the Innu action. I think Peter's a hero. I wish I was with him. Next time, geez, call me. You know, and I don't think that I'm the only one who feels like that. I think that the whole community feels like something needs to change. And not just our community, but all the communities here, Goose Bay, Saji, like all over. Something needs to change. Well, it's been mostly a gray day today, but uh, the sun is trying to peek out now. If we take a look at a live shot of the Narrows, uh, a beautiful evening for the most part. Our temperatures are hovering around the one degree mark uh, outside in St. John's. Feels more like minus five with that wind chill. And we do have some breezy winds. It has been breezy for most of the afternoon, and uh, this is going to continue as we head through the next uh, at least 24 hours, we've got some windy conditions. So taking a look at what we've got on the go right now, we've got that onshore flow that's also going to stick around, uh, leading to some flurries and even some showers around. And generally, this is just going to stick around. If we take a look at the pattern over the next couple of days, uh, this is good news for the icebergs because it will push the icebergs closer. But we do have that onshore flow continuing through uh, midweek. And as we head into next week, uh, also looking at this onshore pattern continuing, what we want to see is this switch to more offshore uh, for April 8th, which is when we would see the eclipse. And that will hopefully keep some uh, cloud cover at bay. We'll talk all about it when I come back. All right, thanks, Ashley. Well, the federal government has announced around a billion dollars to create a national school food program, and that's being received well in this province. The food program will be implemented over the next five years. It hopes to deliver 400,000 more meals to children every year. And while it's not clear just yet how the money will be rolled out in this province, it's positive news for the School Lunch Association. Somewhat yet to be determined, however, it is good news. Essentially, there is money going to flow from the federal government to the provinces. Um, and my understanding right now is that each province will have an opportunity to sign an agreement and see how those funds roll out. Um, but yes, certainly exciting news and it will mean growth uh, for our organization as a charity. 
uh, and potentially other operators in the, in the school food industry. And stay tuned for more of my conversation with John Finn that's coming up in about 20 minutes on Here and Now. Well, the president of the province's Federation of Labor says all workers should get the same consideration for pay increases as members of the House of Assembly. A recent report recommended a $25,000 raise for MHAs. It would be the first pay increase for MHAs in 15 years. It would bring their annual salaries to $120,000 a year. Jessica McCormick says better salaries do help attract talented and diverse politicians, but it's important for MHAs to have perspective on the number of workers struggling to make ends meet. So many workers in the province do not have um, not just adequate wages, but are working without health and dental benefits, are working without pensions or adequate paid sick leave. So I think that you know, my hope is that those workers um, receive just as much consideration for reasonable um, pay increases and access to benefits that members of the House of Assembly are themselves advocating for. One of the groups helping seniors in Newfoundland and Labrador has questions about how the province will allocate the money promised in the budget. The province allocated $10 million in its latest budget for grants to low-income seniors living at home. And that's for supportive services like snow clearing, grocery delivery and financial help to caregivers caregivers of seniors with complex needs who are living at home. Connections for Seniors, a group that offers services in St. John's, has seen demand rise over the past few years and they're hoping to get some stable funding. One of the factors that we have been advocating for for the last couple of years is multi-year funding for organizations like us. Uh, we don't see much uh, support in that realm yet. So that means that when organizations are doing programs, uh, they need to feel stable in the budget that they are operating and the staff that they are supporting. And this is something that has been in the works for the last three years. It's just being extended year to year. Uh, it will be very helpful uh, to see organizations work stably and able to support the population, whether this population is youth, seniors, women, men, it doesn't matter. But every organization in the community is the engine for that society. Mm -hmm. The government is the fuel. And we need to work together in order to deliver the adequate service. Brad Guju and Team Canada had a successful day at the World Curling Championships. The St. John's-based yep, team yep, started yep, the day yep. with a 7-4 to four oh, victory oh, over oh, New Zealand. Oh, nice. This afternoon, they thumped John Schuster's U.S. team 8-2. to two. The Americans shook hands after just six ends of play. The Canadians now have a record of five wins and only one loss. The top six teams in the 13-team field will make the playoffs. Definitely warp in. Well, we've been talking a lot about the anniversary of Confederation, and this is a brand new song from Rum Ragged, marking the 75th anniversary of Confederation. It's called 1949, and it's part of Opera on the Avalon's 75 by 75 series. Among other things, it features performances and interviews focusing on the significance of Confederation. Let's have a little listen to the song. 1959, foresters and loggers strike, turn the union to the riot, sing along the badger drive, all the changes all the time. Well, we had uh, a little bit of snow in uh, and around the area today. We've got more where that came from. I'll talk all about that when I come back.
This weather update is brought to you by the Healthcare Foundation Home Lottery. The bonus prize deadline is midnight, Friday, April 12th. Order tickets now at hcfhomelottery.ca. All right, Ashley, before we get to the weather, I just want to mention we reported earlier about the Newfoundland Growlers hockey team folding, getting little dribs and drabs of uh, information about it and just saw that if anyone out there is wondering about uh, refunds for uh, tickets that they had bought for games that hadn't been played yet, uh, it says here that they will automatically be processed by the Mary Brown Center uh, box office. So just another little tidbit of information there for people out there wondering. Um, folks probably also wondering about the weather. <laughs> so uh, how are things looking in the next 24 hours? Yeah, we've got a, a pretty typical uh, April uh, set up for now. We've got that onshore flow. In fact, uh, some of us are starting to see some of that cloud cover dissipate uh, in that onshore flow. But for the most part, you can certainly see that we've got a couple of fronts associated with that as well. And uh, in that onshore flow, we're still seeing some flurry activity. We've definitely got some colder air in the upper atmosphere, and that's what's leading to those showers, or uh, flurries rather, but we are seeing some showers down for southwestern portions of the province, and that's because you're away from that onshore flow and your temperatures are warmer. If we take a look at where you sat today, uh, Burgio, Portabas, Marystown, six, seven degrees today. If you're in that onshore flow, much different story, anywhere from one to three degrees as your daytime high. Let's see, uh, only topped out at about zero degrees this afternoon. But yeah, up across Labrador, most are sitting, well, all of you are sitting above zero, uh, anywhere from one to three degrees uh, this afternoon. Temperatures have dropped a little bit down to minus one in Lassie, uh, anywhere from zero to plus two across uh, Labrador, and uh, still looking about five, six degrees uh, for southwestern portions of the island. And really, as we continue to see this onshore flow or northerly flow, uh, areas in the southwest will actually see the best weather. So we're looking at uh, some showers and flurries if we're taking a look at the uh, s the current radar. And as we head into tonight and into tomorrow, our next uh, round of snow will move in. But around this time of year, we're seeing much warmer temperatures, first of all, as our daytime highs. The other thing is our sun angle is much higher. So what snow does fall has a little bit harder time accumulating. And that will certainly be the story uh, as we head into tomorrow morning where we're starting to see there on the eastern portion of the Avalon uh, the potential for some snow. So overnight tonight, our temperatures will be hovering around zero or a little bit below. Same thing up across Labrador, anywhere from about minus two to minus six overnight. The winds are also going to stay brisk. Northerly winds anywhere from 40 to 60 kilometers per hour. And then into tomorrow, we'll see some uh, bands of snow move in. By the time we get into noon, we'll likely see uh, some of the heavier bands of snow. But again, this will likely be very wet snow. Uh, temperatures are still hovering above zero for uh, most of us. Uh, but we could pick up a couple centimeters for sure through the afternoon. That will ease off. And then as we get into the evening hours, another round uh, may move in. And this one could bring uh, some snow uh, along with it through the overnight but uh, there is a chance towards the coast that this will all fall as rain, especially in low-lying areas. Uh, we will likely see that fall as rain. So snowfall amounts uh, through Thursday morning. Now, this is just model interpretation of what's going to happen. Uh, it, but for the most part, I think around five centimeters is a good bet. Uh, some areas, especially in the higher elevations, may see a little bit more than that. But overall, this will be uh, what we see through the day. Up across Labrador, really, two to five centimeters will be max uh, for your snowfall totals. So daytime highs away from onshore flow, three, four, five degrees tomorrow. But the winds will be out of the northwest, anywhere from 50 to 70 kilometers per hour. So we'll feel very winter-like tomorrow, especially when we see that snow. Anywhere from 1 to 2 degrees for St. John's, Clarenville, Bonavista. As you head towards central, similar forecasts as far as temperatures are concerned. Again, that potential for some snow through the afternoon periods and then again in the evening. West Coast, uh, really the best chance of seeing that sunshine for you, especially uh, southwestern portions uh, around Port Basque. You're uh, hovering around 3 degrees through the day. Winds are still uh, out of the northeast, though, 30 to 50 kilometers per hour. Some rain certainly in the mix there. Uh, Northern Peninsula, you'll be hovering around two or three degrees, either showers or flurries for the day. 
And then uh, southeastern Labrador northerly winds 20 to 40 kilometers per hour, but your daytime highs will be above zero. Now, the rest of Labrador hovering around there a little bit above. For the west, though, he'll still be staying below zero at about uh, minus one. And again, those winds will be northerly anywhere from 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. So we do have some temperatures dropping a little bit, especially in the overnight up across Labrador, parts of the island as well. But I will get into uh, the long range forecast when I come back a little later in the show. Thanks, Ashley. Well, now back to our top story. Some fish harvesters say they won't be heading out when snow crab season starts, at least not with the way things stand right now. The FFAW is blasting the price-setting panel after it sided with producers on the crab price formula. The time-sensitive season is set to soon begin, but harvesters are talking about tying their boats up yet again this year. Disbelief that... Uh... Uh, we were just totally overlooked. We had a fair, uh, not one-sided, but uh, a fair and a good proposal in. And to not uh, uh, look at the opposite that that was picked and give a reason why they picked the other one, just look for some simple, silly reasons not to pick what we had submitted. An opening price at Dwarf, they did not use uh, any real market uh, ideas as to how they formulated the, the, the opening price or the minimum price that they set. Basically picked a price at it here and said, okay, that's enough. And right now where it stands uh, between the two prices translates to about $30 million that the fishermen will lose this year in Newfoundland. Our harvester is going to be willing and wanting to fish for this ASP formula this year. I can just tell you what I'm going to do. I did make a post this morning referring to my, my plan as a fish harvester. Uh, part, part of getting ready to go, to go fishing is more than uh, just putting gear on and doing maintenance on your boat. It's making sure that everything, all the factors are in line for you to go fishing. Right now the factors are not in line for me to go fishing. I am not going fishing until we get this straightened out. I don't think anyone wants to see a repeat of last year and we know now that the union executive here cannot lead, they cannot lead a tie up, you know, but are there other ways, you know, I guess to fight this decision? Well, there are other ways and uh, well, I've been here now since 7.30, 8 o'clock this morning. I mean, when I got up this morning, I planned on doing some work on my boat. When I looked at my phone, I saw, uh oh, so I headed in here and I mean, basically what's going on now is there's a plan being formulated on how to deal with this. Okay, and is this going to involve demonstrations of any kind? There's a plan being formulated on how to deal with this. That's all we can say. My reaction is uh, the fact that we have a, an impossible situation. This is basically free enterprise, but in, in reverse. We've got a, a situation where the price is being dictated at $2.60 a pound to our fishermen, which is a hell of a lot less than what's being offered to fishermen across the Gulf in the Maritimes. We hear it's between three twenty-five dollars and, and three fifty. dollars and a situation where our harvesters, uh, they can't vote on this because the decision of the panel is, is, is binding. Uh, they can't vote on it. They can't strike because that's illegal under legislation. And the FFAW can't lead the fishermen because it was found liable last year for the six-week tie-up. So like I say, an impossible situation, the reverse of, of free enterprise. From my perspective, the backs of fishermen are through the wall. Make no mistake, this is a tinderbox. We don't know what's going to happen. It's basically being to left the fishermen to take the law into their own hands. Well, school food programs across the country will be getting an infusion of cash from the federal government, $1 billion in the upcoming budget. We'll tell you what it means locally coming up.
The federal government says $1 billion will be set aside in the upcoming budget to fund a national school food program for the next five years. The Prime Minister says that means 400,000 more meals will be served to kids across the country, including here in Newfoundland and Labrador. So for reaction to this, uh, John Finn, the executive director with the School Lunch Association, joins me now. So can you tell me what this new funding will mean for the School Lunch Association. Well, Carolyn, uh, it's extremely exciting news. Uh, kudos to the federal government for investing $1 billion over five years uh, for the entire country to have a national school food program. Uh, what this means for an organization charity uh, such as the School Lunch Association, somewhat yet to be determined. However, it is good news. Essentially, there is money going to flow from the federal government to the provinces. Um, and my understanding right now is that each province will have an opportunity to sign an agreement and see how those funds roll out. Do you know yet how this $1 billion will be divvied up among the provinces? Um, those details, I believe, will eventually roll out after the budget passes. So my understanding, again, is that the announcement yesterday is in advance of the federal budget. And so once the federal budget passes, uh, some of that work will kind of be ongoing. Um, but we were very fortunate yesterday. I actually met with the Minister of uh, Families, Children and Social Development, the federal minister, Jenna Suds. Um, she addressed uh, myself and my colleagues from across the country to talk about uh, this significant announcement. So we're very excited. Details will be, I'm sure, coming in the near future, but at the end of the day, uh, it's very exciting. Uh, as essentially a charity as ours, we're just trying to feed children every day. Right. So still some questions about the rollout, but do you have any kind of sense yet about how this money will be used? What are, are some of your goals for this money? So for our organization in particular, I mean, when we look at expansion, just to put it in context, so about 10 years ago, the School Lunch Association was in about 16 schools. Currently, we're operating in 42 schools. So we've almost tripled our footprint organically um, in just 10 years. And so any funds that would flow to us, um, hopefully, uh, we would be able to expand to other schools and areas that have needs. I would imagine a lot of the funds would be involved and wrapped up in infrastructure. When you talk about kitchen equipment, we're talking about commercial kitchen equipment. We have a strategic plan to look at expansion across the province. Uh, of course, these things take time. Uh, it is our goal to, to serve communities and schools which are in need. Uh, with respect to expanding to rural Newfoundland, it is challenging. There is no doubt about that. When you talk about um, ferries and shipping food in across the, uh, you know, the province. So um, it, it, it certainly is a challenge, but a challenge that we, we can take on. Because um, at the end of the day, the economic benefits of this type of investment are substantial. We're talking additional trucking, we're talking the dairy farmers in Newfoundland and Labrador producing hundreds of thousands more cartons of milk for, for school aged children. So it's exciting. Um, and I think the benefits will be felt not only in urban areas, but across the entire province, rural Newfoundland and, and, uh, and Labrador. So this signals from the federal government that this is a priority for them. And you talked about the expansion of the School Lunch Association over the years. This has clearly been a priority for the provincial government as well, because you've seen your funding increase over the years. Can you talk about the expansion of your funding and, and how much more money you've seen over the past few years in particular? Um, but yes, historically, our program operates as a social enterprise. So essentially, we ask parents to pay what they can. Um, and if that's $5 a day or zero or partial, um, we kind of take that. So our organization in a normal year will see about 70% of the revenue that we need to operate derived from the sale of food. The other 30% is made up in fundraising, uh, donations from corporate sponsors, uh, as well as some, a government subsidy. So. From the provincial government's perspective, we've received $125,000 a year um, just about four years ago, and now we're receiving $1,125,000 a year. So the provincial government's uh, 
has increased our funding to the tune of 100%. Uh, however, having said that, and having said uh, to the good news of the, of the federal program, it is important for folks to know that we're still a charity and we still need to fundraise and receive donations just like any other charity. Uh, economic pressures are hurting families with respect to their ability to pay. Um, and, and for us as an organization that purchases food, we are seeing an increase in the cost of food that we have to purchase and then further a decrease from the families that are able to afford to pay. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword uh, for an organization uh, to the size of ours. Okay, so I guess wait and see what happens next and get those details from the federal government and away you go. <laughs> Absolutely, I mean, we're looking forward to it. We wanna reach out to every child and every family that we can and, and that's our goal and that's our mission. As a, as a charitable organization that's been serving food in Newfoundland and Labrador for over 35 years, this is what we do each and every day and, and we're certainly looking forward to all the help we can get to make it uh, continue to grow. All right, John Finn, thank you so much. Thank you.
Well, to mark 75 years of Confederation, we're digging deep into the Here and Now archives to bring back some special coverage marking the milestone. 20 years after joining Canada, CBC was asking people of the province, was Confederation the right choice? Now, by that time, half of the population was born after the vote. We're going to show you some of that special presentation that was part survey, part history lesson from 1969. Here's part one of Russ Clark's Mission of Grandeur. The young Newfoundlanders. What do they know of the events leading up to Confederation 20 years ago? 49. Do you know the month? No. Do you know what the alternatives were to Confederation at the time of the fight? No. Uh, 40... 45, wasn't it? Members of the older generation remember and have definite views on whether or not Confederation was good or bad for Newfoundland. Were you I for or against I was against it. You were? Yes. How do you feel about it now? Oh, I think it's the best thing ever happened. Twenty years after, it seems the kind of figure popular with politicians, journalists, historians, all trying to appraise the past. Twenty years, it's not a long time. If you were 20 and 49, you're 40 now. If you were 40 and 49, you're 60 now. If you were one, you are 21. You are the inheritors. It took 20 years after the Great War for the Wehrmacht to start putting Europe to fire and sword. A new generation fought that war, mostly new. Do the events of the past maintain the relevance only in the minds of those who took part in them? When Newfoundland joined Confederation? 1949? What, uh, what month? I couldn't know, I don't know. Does it mean anything to you, Confederation? Not very much, not really. Do you know what the alternatives to Confederation were? No. It was born in 1950, I don't know much about it at all. Did the struggle have a mythic quality? Or was it just one manifestation, like millions of others, in our history? of one people's desire to change the course of their destiny. They asked me if I uh, prefer the Americans take over or the Canadians, and I said, well, uh, we'd have to do a lot of considering. What month? I couldn't say. Do you know what the alternatives to Confederation were? No, I don't. What were some of the things you remember about those meetings? Well, uh, uh, when Don Jameson used to be up on the plane going around telling that he wanted um, um, John the United States. What about you? How, uh, I guess, were you born in 1949? I wasn't even thought of then. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you uh, know anything about the, the story of Confederation? Well, you know, only from history, you know. That's all I read in the books, you know, the history book. Does it, does it mean anything to you, uh, what went on, the struggle that was involved, the various factions? Well, no, I never was good at history. No, I always failed. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'd rather be a Canadian. I'd rather be Canadian, I think, than anything else. You'd rather be a Canadian first and a Newfoundlander second? Well, Newfoundland is Canada, right? Yeah. Newfoundland and Canada is, is... What were the immediate benefits that you saw uh, after we joined Canada? Oh, what was the thing that struck you most? Was the people, the poor people. They had money, but they never had before. Do you think that it's important that we remember what went on in 1949 before Confederation? Oh, really? No, no I don't think. Mm -hmm. Does it I mean, mean anything it to you? It doesn't mean a thing to me, not a bit. Are you happy? It to mean, be it mean, oh, definitely, definitely. I mean, I don't think we could have survived, really, without uh, Canada. Well, I agree with myself, the only thing was left for us to do. Uh -huh. Commission government was no good. The responsible government at that time, that was no good. And we're bankrupt. We had 40, well, still not, we had 40 million dollars. But that wouldn't last long. Well, does the, the struggle that went on at the time of Confederation, does it mean anything at all to you today? No. It's just what you learn 
you know, just no dates that you learn in school and things like this. I can remember a lot about it because I worked at it. Did you? Yeah. For Confederation or, or Economic Union? You worked for Economic Union, did you? Yeah. Uh huh. What did you uh, feel about it at the time? Well, I felt at the time I uh, uh, that we uh, we got the Economic Union of the United States. I think we're better off. Uh -huh. Do you still feel at the same time, way? I still feel that way. Does the name Peter Cashin mean anything to you? Well, I can remember uh, an air raid siren that used to blast off every Friday morning, I think around 12 o'clock, and this is the only thing that uh, I associate with Peter Cashin. Think, does it mean anything to you today, what went on in 1949 or the events oh, leading yes. up to Oh, yes. What does it mean to you? Well, I'm very glad that we joined Confederation. We couldn't have done it any other way. And uh, I think uh, Mr. Smallwood had an awful lot to do with it, and this is why I'm, I'm still, you know, for him. It all started back in 1864 when Ambrose Shea, accompanied by Frederick Carter, went to a conference on the prospects of union of the British North American provinces and colonies. Not to commit Newfoundland, mind you, they had no authority, no brief. They went to observe. The papers of the day had a familiar ring. Opponents of Confederation say that our burdens will be increased, particularly in defense. Providing our representatives, Messrs. Shea and Carter, make sure that Newfoundland could enter such a proposed union on terms equal to that of all the other provinces, we can look forward to an era of prosperity without parallel in our history. All party lines wiped out, equal terms with all other provinces, wishful thinking and pride, a strong, stubborn pride that would put the old rock on a par with the continents. It is a pride that persists. We're all for our own native isle, Newfoundland. Not a stranger shall hold one inch of her strand. Her face turns to Britain, her back to the Gulf. Come near at your peril, Canadian world. Things came to a head with the election of 1932. The government of Sir Richard Squires, supported by the young socialist Joseph R. Smallwood, went bankrupt. Unemployment was 60,000 plus. Interest charges on the public debt equaled half the revenue of the province. At six cents a day dole, the populace was not in the mood for scandal, mismanagement, or promises. A daily news editorial read, Young people are beginning to believe that truth, honor, justice, and integrity are merely myths and that life is nothing but a scramble to get what you can. Well, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has offered another advance peek at what will be in the upcoming federal budget. Today, he announced billions in new funding to get more homes built. We'll launch the Canada Housing Infrastructure Fund with a billion dollars available to be allocated in the short term for municipalities to support needs that will directly create more housing and five billion dollars for agreements with provinces and territories to support investments in long-term priorities. Well, speaking over a noisy protest there, uh, Trudeau also announced an additional $400 million for the government's current housing accelerator fund. Money will also be provided for public transit. There are a number of conditions attached to the federal money, including adopting a renter's bill of rights, as well as a zoning and density, as well as zoning and density changes, rather. The federal budget is set for April 16th. An Israeli airstrike has killed seven international aid workers in Gaza. One of the victims was a dual Canadian-American citizen. The group was working with the charity World Central Kitchen, which has been supplying meals and food. The workers were returning to Rafah from northern Gaza at the time. World Central Kitchen says they were traveling in a three-car convoy with two armored vehicles. The charity also says the trip had been coordinated with the Israeli military. Now, Israel says the strike was unintended and an independent expert will investigate. Three British nationals, an Australian, a Polish national and a Palestinian were also killed. The charity says it's now suspending operations in Gaza. 
Well, comedic actor Joe Flaherty has died. Flaherty was an American performer who made an international name for himself as a founder of the Canadian sketch comedy troupe SCTV. Flaherty was born in Pittsburgh and started in dramatic theater after a stint in the U.S. Air Force. Eventually, he joined the Second City Comedy Theater in Chicago. He performed with the company for seven years before moving to Toronto to help set up a Second City troupe in Canada. He also wrote and performed on the SCTV show, playing iconic characters like Anchorman Floyd Robertson, Count Floyd, and talk show host Sammy Maudlin. Flaherty made numerous film and TV appearances, including cameos in Back to the Future 2 and Happy Gilmore. Joe Flaherty died yesterday after a lengthy illness. He was 82. A woman in Halifax is inspiring people who have physical disabilities. Born without a hand, she has bionic prosthetics and is putting them to good use. She's a champion bodybuilder and a certified fitness trainer. The CBC's Paul Palmiter has the story. Marissa Gorgizada was born without a left hand, but it hasn't stopped her from living a very physical lifestyle. Now a 26-year-old fitness instructor, she has three different prosthetics that she wears. She received her first prosthetic arm when she was five, but she spent most of her childhood years not wearing one. I didn't accept myself, so that's why it was such a mental battle for me to make friends, because I just... I, I, would, I couldn't believe anyone would want to be friends with someone with, with one hand, anything like that. This prosthetic, called a B-Bionic hand, is the one she wears the most. It has 14 different grip patterns that help her in a wide variety of daily functions. So if I hold the flex, you'll hear a beep, which then changes the grip pattern to the pointer finger, which I use for pressing buttons and typing. And then I can change the thumb, like so do a power grip and then I can beep again to do another grip pattern. She's had the $55,000 prosthetic for two years and it has changed her life. Always one who took fitness seriously, she has taken part in four bodybuilding competitions where she's won three of them and she's now training for another show in Moncton later this month. When she's working out, she uses this prosthetic, which is more activity specific. So this one here is the weightlifting one. Um, essentially, I got this one when I was 15 or 16 years old, and it helps me with any type of pulling movement, pushing movement, jump rope, any type of balance movement. Like I can do basically any movement with this hand. Gorgizada lives in Halifax but grew up in St. John and has had several prosthetic devices that she received from the Atlantic Clinic for Upper Limb Prosthetics in Fredericton. Prosthetics have come a long way in the last two decades with advances in medical technology. She has a huge social media presence that, that our patients are seeing and it's kind of showing them that you know anything is possible and as an athlete you can compete if you just don't let it get in your way. Paul Palmiter, CBC News, Halifax.
All right, so time for a look at the long range forecast, and uh, that means we're looking ahead to Thursday. Mm -hmm. uh, so, how are things? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, we're in for some snow tomorrow and that's going to really continue through uh, into Friday or sorry, Thursday morning. Let's just take a look at what's going on. Uh, so there is the system there. So another round will will be the story uh, through Wednesday evening and then that will end as rain by Thursday morning. It looks like so temperatures will be a tad warmer. Uh, now, again, away from that onshore flow, we're looking at some sunshine through the day. That will be the story for the southwestern portion of the province, uh, even up across portions of Labrador. You will certainly see uh, some peaks of sun in the mix, but things should generally dry out through the day on Thursday. Uh, but uh, that onshore flow will continue. Temperatures, though, are going to be mild, uh, especially for the southwest, anywhere from 6 to 7 degrees, otherwise between 2 to 5 across the island. Labrador, you're looking at your temperatures hovering anywhere from zero in the west with those flurries to about one or two degrees, especially towards the coast and maybe even along the strait. Uh, a little bit warmer than that on Thursday, uh, but you're also looking at the chance with these temperatures, uh, some also some milder air in the upper atmosphere. This could fall as some showers. Now, Thursday evening and into Friday, generally quiet, at least to start on Friday morning. Then we're going to see uh, our next weather maker move in. This one again, going to bring the chance of some potential flurries, maybe even some showers through the overnight period on Friday. Uh, but for the most part, our daytime highs will be between one and five degrees. So we're really not seeing a whole lot of movement in those temperatures, but some peaks of sun, certainly for central west coast and uh, towards the uh, coast of Labrador. And then even along the strait, uh, we're still looking at the chance of some showers or flurries through the day on Friday. Uh, otherwise, anywhere uh, with temperatures around zero, maybe a little bit above for Labrador and uh, to the north, you're looking at your temperatures a little bit below. Now, the long range forecast as we head into Sunday will be filled with gray skies. Also, the chance of some showers or flurries, and that's because our daytime highs will be between one and three degrees. Now, overnight around zero, maybe a little bit below. And then for central and eastern, uh, sorry, central and western Newfoundland, uh, temperatures will warm up. Better chance of seeing the sun, though, especially as we head towards the end of the weekend for western Newfoundland. But uh, it will stay unsettled for central with temperatures between 4 and 6 degrees. And then for uh, eastern Labrador, look at that, warming up to about plus 8 for your weekend. Uh, you may see a few flurries to start the day on Saturday, but uh, it will end nicely. And we'll see some sunshine on Sunday. And same thing for Western Labrador. A tad cooler, though, with your temperatures around 2 degrees. And oh, this is that be <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> yeah, some Easter colors there. Uh, Marilyn captured this lovely shot of uh, Calls Har in Calls Harbor there. Thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you have any weather photos that you would like to share with us, you can send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Oh, I just love that. It's like kind of like a practice. Painting? It did look like that. Yeah, yeah. it's just beautiful. Great Definitely. shot. Thank you so much for that. All right. Well, that's it for us on this Tuesday. Short week for a lot of people. It is. A long weekend. So uh, <laughs> over the next few days, we're going to be talking more and more about the eclipse that is coming up next week. A lot of people very excited. She's trying to get me to say that it's going to be sunny, but I can't oh, answer that question only. yet. It's not. It's looking kind of cloudy right now. Yeah, we'll we're going to keep happens. a close eye on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us.